August 1936, the Olympic Games in Berlin. The Hitler regime wants to set the stage and present as a peaceful country. Director Leni Riefenstahl shapes the imagery of the production. Her Olympic film becomes an icon of film history, produced in the name of the Nazi propaganda. Unnoticed tragedies play out beneath the facade of the happy, celebrating crowds. One in particular has left deep scars until today. We thought he was Japanese. As an athlete, he achieved the ultimate goal of his life in Berlin. It was a bitter victory. He was not a happy, but rather a sad gold medalist. Ki chung Zon must run under a false name and a foreign flag. The Korean wins for Japan, the power that is repressing his own people. There stands a Korean who needs to sing the Japanese national anthem. There must be some kind of story behind this man, Leni Hefenstahl would have thought. Seoul, the South Korean capital, today the center of a proud industrialized nation. When the Olympic Games began in Berlin, the Japanese flag flew above Seoul. Japanese troops occupied Korea at the outset of the 20th century. The empire enters as a brutal colonial power, under the yoke of which the Koreans suffer until 1945. In Seoul today, the Ki Chung Zon Memorial is a reminder of the man who completed the most important race of his life in Berlin. The 24-year-old Zon has to run the Olympic marathon for the occupying power. The contest will completely transform his life. I once asked my grandfather, what would have happened if you hadn't won? To which he replied, then I would have returned after my prison sentence. In Korea today, Zon is seen as a historical role model who, with tremendous willpower and endurance, ran in his darkest hour for the national cause. And of all places to do it, it was at the Olympic Games in Hitler's Germany. 1896 saw the first Olympic Games of the modern age. The Nazis are at first less than enthusiastic at the Games being held in Germany in 1936. They're too liberal, too ethnically impure but they quickly become aware of the opportunity to use them as a platform for propaganda. Hitler and Goebbels want to exploit the Olympics for their own purposes and create a cosmopolitan global event attended by thousands of guests. Despite concerns expressed by the United States and calls for a boycott by Jewish organizations, 49 sporting nations come together in Berlin. In Berlin wurde die aus 150 Kämpfern bestehende Olympiamannschaft der Japaner herzlich empfangen. The Japanese Empire travels with a sizable delegation. In a few years from now, the country will be Germany's main ally in World War II. This is when Japan awakens as a nation. Until then, it had for many years, even centuries, been in isolation. And suddenly it opened up. It understood that this was necessary. For the first time, it had a role at the 1932 Olympic Games, sent large groups to study abroad, and also had an Olympic delegation, which participated and was very successful. Japan takes great interest in the Berlin Olympics. The 1940 Games are supposed to be held in Tokyo, and Berlin will serve as an important model. The empire dispatches strong swimmers and athletes to the German capital and especially in one discipline, it wants to do well and secure world recognition. The 42-kilometer marathon, for many the most prestigious of all Olympic disciplines. Devised especially for the games of the modern era, the Olympic track event has special significance worldwide. The Olympic Stadium in Berlin. Hitler declared its building to be a matter for the Reich, and this is reflected in its architectural design. 
The Marathon Gate, with its two towers, intersects the Grand Oval. This is where Hitler will enter at the opening of the Games. According to legend, a runner brought the Athenians news of the victory at the Battle of Marathon. Then he collapsed and died. The Games of 1936 draw a special significance from this myth. At the suggestion of German sports officials, for the first time there is a torch relay. The Olympic flame will be borne on foot from ancient Olympia in Greece to Berlin, an idea which still forms part of the tradition of today's Games. With her film on the Olympics, Leni Riefenstahl delivers images full of pathos. Appointed special filming rights, Hitler's favorite film director is present at the stadium each and every day. The marathon will also change her life forever. This almost superhuman performance, enduring a route of over 42 kilometers, surely fascinated her. But I think she was also inspired by the legend of the runner of marathon, and it was clear to her that it was to be one of the highlights of the film. The race creates a remarkable personal bond between her and the marathon winner of 1936. In Seoul, in the archive of the Zorn Foundation, evidence of this unexpected relationship is stored. Leni Riefenstahl met my grandfather in 1936. When he first entered the stadium, he looked like someone who was running for his life. This must have made an enormous impression on her, and thus began her friendship with Ki Chung Zorn. June 1936. The small team of Korean marathon runners sets off on its way to Berlin weeks in advance of the official Japanese delegation. Traveling on the Trans-Siberian Railway, it takes the six sportsmen almost three weeks to get there. They want to acclimatize to the conditions in Berlin before anyone else. Zorn is registered at the Games under the name Kite Son, the Japanese form of his Korean first name. He travels together with his fellow countryman, Nan. The runners do not receive a warm welcome in Berlin, a high-ranking envoy of the Japanese embassy meets them at Friedrichstrasse station in disapproval of two Koreans being Japan's hopefuls for the marathon. With their first words uttered, they all showed us their disapproval. After the long and exhausting journey, we had finally arrived at the station in Berlin, only to be met with this greeting. Without being able to help it, I felt hot tears fill my eyes. Japan's contempt for Koreans has deep roots. The nation of the rising sun is, after its long isolation, an aspiring country with a great deal of catching up to do. After the US forced its opening up in the 19th century, Japan quickly learns from the West. In addition to modernizing its political system, economics and the sciences, the empire also implements a modern military system. It takes the Prussian army as its guiding example. Similar to Germany, Japan also wants colonies, preferably on the Asian continent. In 1894, the first Japanese-Chinese war breaks out. The island of Taiwan is conquered. Ten years later, Japan attacks Russia to break its stranglehold on Manchuria's raw materials. Japan is victorious on land and on water and now counts as one of the imperialist powers. In 1910, the Imperial Kingdom annexes the Korean Peninsula and declares it a colony. A Japanese general governor takes on rule in Seoul. The Korean flag is banned. Above the city, the occupiers erect a Shinto shrine, a symbol of the Japanese emperor worship. 
the majority of the Buddhist and Christian population is forced into obeisance and Shinto is declared a state religion. So begins a decade of cultural repression. Japanese becomes the official language. Korean names are changed to sound more Japanese. Still, the new rulers encounter fierce resistance. Above all else, Korea is exploited economically. The country is rich in rice and mineral reserves. The growing Japanese industry needs resources and labor. The colonial influence also extends to sports. The Yangchung Secondary School in Seoul is an elite talent incubator for athletes. Zorn is one of the students. The athlete who came sixth in the 1932 Los Angeles Olympics was schooled here. Korean runners are renowned for their rigorous training. The Japanese want to reap their success for themselves and allow the Koreans to compete. For a people oppressed and dominated by Japan, there were not many sports that could express a spirit of resistance. There was, of course, football, basketball or speed skating, but with the marathon, it was easiest to show resistance. And it didn't cost much. As a result, the marathon was very popular and there were also a lot of good runners. The best runner is Ki Chung Son. In 1912, two years after the Japanese invasion, he is born on the border with China, in what is today North Korea. It is a poor and harsh region, with little more to offer than forests and wood felling. The bridge over the Yalu River is the gateway to Manchuria and at the same time the lifeline of the region. Zorn's youth is one of constant struggle. He has to earn fees for his own schooling as a messenger. Being in constant motion is going to be his all-consuming passion. He soon takes part in regional competitions and wins. As a result, Zorn begins dreaming of becoming a successful athlete. He hasn't enough money to attend secondary school. Zorn needs to work full-time while still keeping up his running. A success in a competition gives him the chance of a lifetime. Zorn is accepted at the Yangchun Elite Academy. The runner my grandfather admired the most was the Finn, Pavo Nomi. He earned the nickname Flying Finn. He was an Olympic gold medal winner for middle and long distance running. Zorn wanted to be like Nomi. The others didn't have a goal like that. Zorn is ambitious, trains hard, and runs his first world-class times. His first great test is in the autumn of 1935. Zorn travels to Tokyo for the National Meiji Sports Competition, named after the Emperor Meiji, under whose rule Japan made the leap to becoming a modern great power. The competition at the Meiji Stadium is a national event, and also where the preliminary decisions for the Olympic selection are made. Zon manages sensationally. He wins the marathon with a strong lead and sets a world record at 2 hours, 26 minutes, 42 seconds. His compatriot Nan is also one of the best. But for the Japanese, it is out of the question to nominate two Koreans for a total of three starting places for the marathon in Berlin. With further trial runs, they try and get rid of at least one Korean without success. Zon and Nan are simply too fast. In the end, the two Koreans will be joined by two other Japanese competitors in the Olympic marathon team. The Japanese want to postpone the final selection until shortly before the race. Before departure, the men have to pray for victory at the Meiji Shrine.
役員の森田俊彦氏や佐藤浩ちゃんに引率されて明治神宮に参拝必勝祈願を込めついで球場を擁拝いたしましたファンの人は、The German army has turned the often underappreciated sandy soil in Brandenburg into a little paradise. It's home to over 2,000 athletes from all over the world. Naturally, there's also a sports ground in the village where the Japanese eagerly train and keep themselves in top form. Guests from the Far East are made to feel comfortable. Asian cuisine is provided. And there's even a Japanese bath. Zorn enters a whole new world. He personally meets the sporting legends of whom he had previously only heard. The Greek, Spiridon Lewis, the first marathon winner of 1896. Pavo Nomi, the flying Finn, his role model. Jesse Owens, the shining star of the games, who will later be depicted as sharing Zorn's destiny. His relationship with the Japanese delegation remains tense. Zon and Nan are aware of the reluctance of the Japanese marathon coach to let them both run the race. Zon reacts with silent rebellion. Wherever he appears with his Japanese team colleagues, he never fails to highlight his Korean origins. Zon signs autographs with his real name, Kichung Son. Not with the enforced Japanese Kite son. And he always adds Korea after his signature. It is striking that, unlike other Koreans in the Japanese team, he often emphasized that his home country was Korea. This was, however, completely accepted and was noted by the journalists, that is, in the case of the German journalists, as a distinctive feature and as noteworthy of mention. With this, you can already detect a very strong connection with Korea. Zon refuses to wear the Japanese jersey, with the excuse of keeping it in good condition until he faces the competition. He is the only one who doesn't wear it, even when attending a reception with the ambassador. Because Ki Chung Zon never wore clothing emblazoned with the Japanese flag, the Japanese slowly realized that he was refusing to wear their uniform. The Korean basketball player, who was also competing in Berlin, said to Zon, What's the point in coming this far and then not being allowed to compete? He answered, Then there will be no marathon victory in Berlin. Japan's sports officials are trying to keep the Korean national pride in check. They still hope that they can use two native Japanese runners for the marathon. Then something happened which blew my mind. Shortly before the games, our coach Sato said, We're going to do a timed 30 km run. To select the three runners for the marathon. Simply crazy to order such a feat before the real race. I had no sympathy for them after that. The final selection, barely three weeks before the competition. Zon and Nan run in specially designed shoes, similar to traditional Japanese footwear. The run partly crosses over the marathon route. The Japanese runner Shiwaku. Tries to secretly shorten the route. Nevertheless, Zon and Nan win the race by far. At last, their place as competitors is confirmed. On the 1st of August, the games will be opened with great fanfare.
Under the eyes of more than 100,000 spectators and the whole world, Hitler enters the stadium to present Germany as a friendly yet immensely powerful empire. The ugly side of the Nazi regime, the brutal persecution of tens of thousands of Jews and other so-called Volkszersetzer, corruptors of the people, remains hidden in the shadows of this grandiose illusion. Leni Riefenstahl captures this grand spectacle of propaganda on film. Greece, the birthplace of the Olympic Games, opens the parade with the marathon winner Spiridon Luis at its head. The team and a few others salute with the Olympic greeting, which has been in use since 1924. This makes for great enthusiasm in the stadium, as the gesture is confused with the Nazi salute. Other teams, in contrast, consciously refuse to make the gesture. The Japanese team has other problems to deal with. Due to organizational reasons, some of the athletes of the Emperor's Army are forced to march behind the Korean athletes. A disgrace. For Hitler, this was already a huge PR success. That he could alone be seen every day on the VIP stand was already something special. In this respect, Hitler had skillfully calculated that he could be viewed as a peaceful chancellor. The festivities make a great impression on Zorn. The young athlete from the North Korean province has never seen an event quite like this. Zorn knows that he must soon step onto the great stage to accomplish his goal. The 9th of August, 1936, the day of the big race. It's a warm day in Berlin. 120,000 expectant spectators pour into the stadium. There was really something going on in the stadium. You can imagine when they all jumped to their feet. When you look at it today, the mood was also surely somewhat ratcheted up. Along the course of the Grunewald and alongside the Avis motorway, around a million spectators are waiting for the runners. The reporters have also got themselves in position. The marathon will be broadcast live for the first time. Argentina's Carlos Zabala, winner of the Los Angeles Games four years earlier, is a big favorite. At 3 p.m., the best long-distance runners in the world are on the starting line. Zorn is wearing his Japanese jersey for the first and also last time. The time has come. If I miss this opportunity, it's all over. Whatever happens in four years cannot be predicted. I have to win. Gigantischste Probe der Athleten, 42 Kilometer bis zum Ziel. 56 Läufer, die härtesten und zähesten Kämpfer aller Erdteile, setzen ihr Letztes ein für den Sieg ihres Landes. Der Ballade Argentinien will ein zweites Mal gewinnen. Es geht gleich an die Spitze. Aber seine Gegner sind stark. Die besten Langstreckenläufer aus der ganzen Welt. Oliver, sein Landsmann, die Finnen, die Südafrikaner, die Engländer, die Leute von USA und die Japaner wissen, was sie wollen. Vor allem ihr Favorit. The Argentinian has forged ahead. Just a few kilometers into the race, he has a considerable lead. Zorn and the British Bernie Harper are up behind him. Zorn is getting nervous. Zabala is too far away. But Harper calls out to him, slow, slow. This is Zorn's saving grace. Achtung, Achtung, here is the Wendepunkt of the Arus. 
noch immer für Zabala. Weit auseinandergerissen ist jetzt das große Feld der Marathonläufer. Endlos zieht es sich über den glühenden Asphalt der Abus. Hinter Zabala liegen der Japaner Kitai Son und der Engländer Harper schon an Schulter auf dem zweiten Platz. At Kilometer 31, Son catches up with Zabala. Hier ist der Sprecher am Kaiser Wilhelm Turm. Die Läufer haben schon 35 Kilometer hinter sich. Zabala, der Sieger von Los Angeles ist zusammengebrochen. Das schnelle Anfangstempo hat ihn zermürbt. Son, Japan führt. Son keeps his lead. His compatriot has worked his way up into third place. Son, der Japaner führt seit langem. Er kommt jetzt über das Maifeld dem Stadion zu. Frisch noch ist sein Schritt. 120.000 sind still, 120.000 sind von ihren Plätzen aufgestanden und warten, sehen auf das dunkle Tor den Eingang zum Hauptkampffeld, wo der japanische Sieger Son kommen muss, der koreanische Student. In einem rasenden Endspurt ja, der heran, der kleine Mann, die rote Sonne im weißen Feld leuchtet. Son Senshu, Itchak, 2 Meter. To us, he was Japanese. That's what I knew back then. It was only afterwards I learned he was Korean. In Japan, the newspapers fall over themselves to declare news of the victory. Japan has triumphed. A quarter of a century after the first Olympics, the dream has come true. The bitter tears are a thing of the past. So they praise Son's victory for the Imperial Empire. My wish has come true, but I have to think about the suffering of my childhood and poverty, the oppression that my shattered nation has endured to this day. I can scarcely hold back the tears. At two hours and 29 minutes, Zon has set a new Olympic record. The Briton Harper comes in second, and in third place, Zon's countryman, Nan. For the first time, I understood the Japanese flag and the Japanese anthem. This is my victory. But what does this flag mean? What does the grasp of the Japanese mean to my countrymen? I didn't run for the Japanese. I ran for myself and for my long-suffering people. Never again will I run under the Japanese flag. Pian. Contrite, sad, or full of shame, I have no idea how he may have felt. Yet, as ever, his facial expression was complex. One could see his pain. If you look at the photos of the award ceremony, then there seems to have been no Japanese flag at all. It was concealed by the little oak tree. In a radio speech, he is to dedicate his victory to the Japanese Imperial Empire. He delivers it in Korean even though he speaks Japanese well. But how deep is Zon's inner conflict? Images from Japanese newsreels show him as a happy young man at the moment of his greatest triumph. For the woman who will later turn him into an icon with her images, 
Berlin 1936 is also the peak of her career. Two years after the Games, Leni Riefenstahl released her Olympic film. The film certainly contributed to the creation of a national hero and naturally also reflects Riefenstahl's vision of people like Son. She does, of course, take a heroic view of athletes. She puts them on a pedestal, characterizes them as superhuman beings who perform the inconceivable. This is the message with which you create a hero, a superhero. Amongst Koreans, news of their countryman's victory spreads like wildfire. It is also a message of national hope. At Guang Wamun Junction, where the Dong A Ilbo newspaper office is based, the community furtively gathered, followed the radio transmissions, and waited for the special report. People were filled with hope. At the moment of the victory, cheers rang out throughout the country. They sounded like calls for Korean independence. Korean journalists want to set an example. Their newspapers are subject to strict censorship by Japanese authorities. But one particularly courageous editor dares to stand up to the Japanese. My deceased father, Gil Yong Lee, had received the edition of the Asahi Graph weekly newspaper that had just been published in Japan. When he saw Ki Chung Zon's gold medal in it, he made a difficult decision. Zon's proud victory photo with the red sun globe on his chest, is all over the press in Japan. The publishers in Seoul edit Japan's flag off his chest. It's only after the edition is published that the occupying power can react. The newspaper is shut down. Lee, the editor responsible, and his colleagues are imprisoned and banned from any form of work. The mood tips to Zorn's disadvantage. His victory is now seen as a threat to Japanese security in occupied Korea. The station troops fear the growing national consciousness of the Koreans. On his return to Tokyo, Zorn still receives a hero's welcome. This is not to be repeated in Korea, and Zorn is inconspicuously flown to Seoul away from the public eye. Only a few confidants are allowed to meet him. Japanese minders follow him at every turn. During his last year at the Yangchung Elite Training School, he is not allowed to appear publicly. Even running events are out of bounds to him. Private student parties are broken up by police. He is monitored by the Secret Service around the clock. The pressure is too great. I would rather give back my victory. His triumph in Berlin has become a burden. The cases of political resistance are documented in Japanese secret police files. Ki Chung Zon's behavior in Berlin is assessed as being subversive. Zon offered the Koreans a way of expressing their national identity. The Japanese wanted to prevent this in any way possible. The authorities push Zon to go and study in Japan. They want to keep him away from his compatriots. Zon gives in. In Tokyo, he is allowed to enroll and study law at the private Meiji University. Unlike the state universities, it is also open to students from the colonies. On condition that Zorn must not participate in competitions and must avoid public gatherings, the Olympic winner will never again compete as a runner in public competitions.
明治大学を入っても My father told me that despite everything, throughout his time at university, he always ran around his home in Yoyogi Uehara, early in the morning when no one was watching. My father never again wanted to run under the Japanese flag, but he did tell me that he would have liked to run under the colors of the Meiji University. The world is in turmoil. The Japanese Imperial Empire is expanding ever more aggressively in Asia and attacks the Chinese mainland. Shortly thereafter, Germany attacks Poland. The Second World War begins. Hitler's ally, Japan, conquers almost all of East Asia. With its attack on Pearl Harbor, The Imperial Kingdom provokes the United States into entering the war. Korea is also pulled into the Second World War. Its men are recruited or have to work as forced laborers in the war industry. Tens of thousands of women are forced to work as prostitutes in Japanese front line brothels. Zon works as a bank clerk in Seoul. He's now married and has two children. But the happiness does not last. Shortly after, his mother and his wife both die. War and occupation rob him not only of a sporting career, but also the dream of a family and contentment. The Second World War ends in a crushing defeat for Japan. The two US atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki forced the Imperial Empire to surrender on the 15th of August 1945. For Korea, it is the day of liberation. After 35 years, The Korean flag flies over Seoul once again. A second life begins for 33 year old Zon. The hero of 1936 fell into obscurity during the war, but liberated Korea discovers him once again and celebrates him as the national hero that defied the Japanese. Zon becomes a coach. And now his proteges can achieve what he himself was denied as a runner to win in Korean colors. Zon's athletes win several times at the prestigious Boston Marathon. In 1950, they took the first three places. Korea is one of the great marathon nations of the post war period. To cheer them on, at that time in Boston, Ki Chung Zon shouted at the top of his voice, Run for your fatherland. Run for the Republic of Korea. It must have been a moving moment for him. But Korea falls into the next disaster. After the Second World War, the country was divided. In 1950, the Communist North attacks the Democratic South. In the end, Millions are dead, and the division of the country is greater than ever, up until this very day. Zon will never see his North Korean home again. He remains in Seoul, the capital of South Korea. The Olympic champion and top coach is gifted a flower factory by the government. This is to ensure his livelihood so he has enough time to train his athletes. But Zorn is not cut out to be an entrepreneur. His whole life was marathon. My father was not an entrepreneur. He had no entrepreneurial awareness and left the business to his second wife. Commercial operations didn't go well, and at the end, he went bankrupt. This was an emotional shock for him, as the bankruptcy also had consequences on the family. The end of his second marriage follows the financial ruin. The family falls apart. 
Far away in Japanese Yokohama lives Zon's son from his first marriage. Throughout his childhood, Chung In-zon has barely known his father. I was born in 1943, and in the following year my mother died. He could not take care of us, so he took my sister and I to his brother's home, because he was always on the go and busy promoting marathons and leading talented runners to success at the Boston Marathon. There he was full of passion, but he was less interested in whether his children were still alive or not. He wasn't particularly conscientious about his family. One side of me greatly reveres this great man, but as a son, I'm naturally disappointed. Chung In-zon wanted to study in the USA after the Korean War, but instead his father sent him to Japan, to the same university where he himself had studied during the colonial period. After completing his studies, Chung In-zon remains in Japan. After his father's bankruptcy, a return to Korea is no longer an option for him. In Japan, he works for the unification of the Korean minority. To this day, the largest ethnic minority in Japan. Through lectures, he keeps the memory of his father's fate alive. He had his own view of the sovereign state of Japan. But he was bound to the Japanese in a friendly relationship, regardless of nationality. It was a humanist side to him. He wanted to live together peacefully with the Japanese. It was an ambivalent relationship. Zorn's inner conflict reflects the tense relationship between the newly formed Korea and Japan. It was not until 1965 that the two countries normalized diplomatic relations. Zorn does not want to be a pawn of national interests his success of 1936 unites him forever with the people of the former colonial power. He used to have a good relationship with Tajima Naoto, who was Japanese and had won a gold medal for long jump in Berlin, and also the 10,000-meter runner Murakoso Kohei. So it may be that some in Korea thought he was going too far. The fact that he remained friendly with the people who had so oppressed their nation did not go down well with many. It didn't interest him. He was only concerned with national understanding made possible through sport. He embodied the Olympic spirit in the best possible sense. Professor Zenichi Terajima from the Meiji University is trying to keep Zon's memory alive, for in Japan, the bearer of its first gold medal has been forgotten in the annals of the Imperial Empire's history. Zon's story used to feature in Japanese schoolbooks, but today that's no longer the case, and the media hardly mentions the story. One could say that following the war, Zon was systematically erased from the Japanese memory. In his homeland Korea, Zorn is now a national icon, a marathon winner for life. Every child knows his story, and wherever he appears in the country, his run in Berlin is celebrated as a patriotic feat for the proud nation. Zorn travels around the world and represents his homeland at international sporting events. Twenty years after the Olympics, he returns to Berlin for the first time, where he achieved his victory. After the horrors of the Nazi dictatorship, the memories of the Olympics in 1936 
have faded. This run plays like a film before my eyes. These 42.195 kilometers, which I accomplished with the Japanese flag on my chest. Zorn comes to a very different Germany, divided into two like his own home country. Here, he meets a familiar face. Leni Riefenstahl, despite her closeness to the Nazi regime, was only considered as something of a follower. She no longer shoots feature films and becomes a photographer. But the memory of the 1936 games connect Riefenstahl and Zorn. In the days following his victory, the director invited Zorn to reshoot the close-ups for the Olympic film. For both, it was an experience that stayed with them. These recordings, which she made at the time, were what made him an international hero. And he was able to show what happened then, even after the war. And this is why the bond was so strong, because it reminded them in different ways of a central event in their lives. There is a regular exchange of letters between Zorn and Riefenstahl, which lasts for decades. Greeting cards, photos, memories. The tone is warm. They meet regularly at different places around the world. It is a lifelong friendship. Riefenstahl edits a shortened version of the original two-part Olympic film for Zorn. Above all, it shows the marathon, a very personal reminder. Riefenstahl's images still shape the Koreans' memory of their most famous runner. In 1988, a national dream comes true. The Olympic Summer Games go to Seoul and not the Japanese competitor in Nagoya. When grandfather carried the torch, I cried. When you look at the torch scene of the 1988 Olympics, you can see that he was bouncing more than running. This race was to show the world, I am Ki Chung Sun, a Korean. He had waited so long for it. Zon's joyous run is his first on an international stage since the Berlin Games. And it is also his last. But he is denied one thing recognition of the gold medal for his country, Korea. To this day, it remains in the medals table of 1936 under Japan. However, Zorn's dream of a truly Korean Olympic victory in the marathon is soon within reach. Barcelona 1992. It is the 9th of August, exactly 56 years after Zorn's victory in Berlin. Korean marathon runner Yong Cho Hwang has a head-to-head -head race with the Japanese Morishita. For almost 10 minutes, they run side by side at the head of the pack. Perhaps this is the payback by the Koreans for 1936, when Song Ki Chung, the Korean, had to run under the Japanese name of Kitai Son in winning that Olympic marathon in Berlin. And he had to run under the colors of Japan. Before we left for the Olympic Games, he told the marathon athletes, in my life I have one dream. I would like to see one of you young athletes win the Olympic gold medal. The outcome is clear two kilometers before the finish line. Huang leaves Morishita from Japan behind. And this time it's going to be a Korean entering the stadium. But this is going to be the winner. Young Cho Huang crosses the finish line. I went and hung the medal around his neck. He looked at me and said, I am proud. I, as an athlete of a 1945 liberated, self-confident Korea, participated in the Olympics under the Korean flag. 
Ki Chung Son must have been envious of me. This medal for Korea fulfills Son's life dream. But one wish remains, reconciliation with Japan, the colonial power of the past. In 2002, a few months before Zon's death, a small breakthrough in the difficult relationship is achieved. Korea and Japan are jointly hosting the World Cup. Up until that point, a joint hosting was unthinkable. Japan wanted the Football World Championship for itself, as did Korea. And because both countries wanted the World Cup, FIFA made a smart proposal. Japan and Korea should jointly play it out. My father said, this Korean-Japanese World Cup has to be a success, so that the bitterness of the past can end and the two countries can go peacefully together into the future. In November 2002, at 90 years of age, Ki Chung Sun passes away. He's buried at the National Cemetery of Honor in Korea, the only sportsman laid here to date. It's only at the end of his life that Ki Chung Sun's long run comes to the end. A life between two identities, a Korean patriot who was forced to conquer under a false flag. <laughs>